Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Photo with Catherine Hall and Leo Laporte. Episode 22, recorded August 30th, 2011. Vincent Lafore. Twit Photo is brought to you by Carbonite Online Backup. Automatic and unlimited backup for your computer files with anytime, anywhere access. For a free trial, plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com and use the offer code TWITPHOTO. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Twitch Photo, the show that uh, talks all about photography as an art and helps you make more artistic photos. And who better to do that than Catherine Hall? CatherineHall.net. She is a fantastic photographer herself, uh, a, a true artist, and uh, brings to the show every week another great artist for us to interview. Well, Catherine. thanks. It's well, I can't take all the credit for this week. I have to give credit to Dane Sanders. He is the one that actually introduced me to Vincent. And for all of you guys that want to check out another interview with Vincent after our episode, you can go to Dane Sanders' blog. And he has a ton of, I think he's had 133 interviews on his site. Well, that's fantastic. And he's a great educator. So. Well, Dane, thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, Dane. Yeah, and we really appreciate it. so excited it. that you introduced me to Vincent. Um, just so uh, needless to say, Vincent LaForet is our guest. Yes. We're going to talk about him in just a bit, but I do, you know, one of the things I like to do is give you the cred that you deserve for the artist that you are. So if you go to CatherineHall.net, you'll see on her website, great pictures, great stuff. And uh, the introduction uh, to a brand new magazine. Yeah, so normally we start off with a photo and a tip based on it. Um, but this week I decided in lieu of the revolutionary launch of Scott Kelby's and Matt. I can never pronounce his last name. How do you pronounce Matt's last name? I don't know. Matt who? Ka Kao Anyway, Scott and Matt. Let's just <laughs> say, we'll go by first name basis. I don't know his last name. Um, well, anyway, Kelby Media re released Light It, um, which is a iPad purely only. digital, only for the I iPad. I think that's really looking cool. And I'm going to show you guys. I did a whole review on my blog, so you can t definitely check it out. Um, it's free, but, too, which is nice. Well, it's two ninety nine, but the first episode is, or first I issue is free. All right. But I'm just going to walk you through and just show you a, one of my favorite a couple of my favorite features. Check out the blog to see more. But the whole magazine is basically created in a way that's taking advantage of everything the iPad is capable of. And so, for example, we're starting here, and we go straight to the table of contents. And I love this. You click on a story. Hmm, what story do I want to do? Let's do... Where did it go? How about the feature story? I want to... Uh, yeah, I want to do... Because there's video in... I can't... Joe McNally. And there's video embedded. And you can skip around. There's, it has awesome navigation features. So it's so fun. You double click on the photos. Look at that. You would can, you compare this to what kind of photo magazine? Is, is it a more of a how-to? It it's all fear? on lighting. It's dedicated. It's all light, lighting. It's dedicated oh, completely to lighting. Great. And there's so many things about it. I'm not going to go into detail. You can read my blog. But um, That's neat. Look at the light in that. Wow. It is awesome. And... If you have an iPad, it's the first, you've got to download it and check it out. And if you don't have an iPad, you should go buy one. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Worth buying an iPad just for the Do man. Do you have an iPad, Vincent? I have two. There you go. Let's welcome Vincent LaForet, who is really an amazing photographer and really more, certainly became known to me as one of the first people to shoot video with the Canon 5D Mark II and get such amazing images. We all saw... Reverie, I guess is what it was called. The first one, The first yeah. one. Uh, Vince, it's great to have you on Twit, uh, on, uh, Twit Photo. Yeah, I'm Thanks super excited. I, I have to say, he's known for his, his video work wor worldwide now. But I've admired your photographs for the better part of my career. They're, you're always doing something that's just above the curve. And so I think it's natural that video would be a part of that journey. But your work, especially all your aerial photography and everything, has been a big... Um, when 
I would say inspiration, but it feels kind of out of my reach. It's so good. <laughs> but it's just been very fascinating to watch your career and all of it. So I appreciate it. It's been, uh, it's been a fun ride, that's for sure. Do you, do you kind of, do you still do still photography? I mean, do you, do you regret being known as a videographer these days? I wouldn't say I regret it because I did do still photography for 20 years of my life since I've been 15. And uh, I'm loving every day of, of being in the, in the live action world or, you know, movies and commercials. Uh, I do miss it. Um, you know, this, the industry does tend to pigeonhole you. You're either a photographer yep. or a filmmaker, and that's definitely happened to me. Um, I do some fine art stuff still, and uh, every time I take a camera out, uh, it's like meditation for me. Because relative to working with, you know, 20 to 50 to 100 people, when you're just by yourself with your camera, uh, for me, it's almost meditative. Was it a difficult transition to go from still to moving images? Um, I had always been a, a fan of, of filmmaking. I had a biological dad, a natural dad, and uh, or dad that brought me up, both of whom worked in the film industry. So my first recollections were being on film sets um, as a kid. So I always knew I wanted to end up there at some point. That being said, the three-year transition was one of the single most uh, challenging and intellectually stimulating three years of my life. There's a lot of technology you got to learn. This is a, this is the most recent uh, video I saw. This is from an ad for Famous Footwear. But mm -hmm. what's interesting is yes, it's moving, but these are almost a compilation of stills. That's what it feels like to me. It's very it's poetic. Shot, yeah, it's shot on the Phantom at 600 frames a second. Um, it's lit with a quarter million watts of light to get wow. F2, wow. f2, which is it just shows you you know how much light you need to shoot at these high speeds. Uh, but this was a blast of shooting. It was shot in the middle of the summer. Uh, so all that oh, wow. snow is all fake and all the whole set is dressed and uh, that was a big production. Oh, it's so gorgeous. So the Phantom is designed to do this super slow-mo thing? Yeah, it goes up to, I know, at least 1,000 or 2,000 frames a second, but at 2K or 1080 resolution, um, you're hitting the top edge of that uh, at 600 frames per second. Are there other tricks, though, involved here to make it feel more 3D? Because it really feels 3D. Not really. Um, it's just about layering. So what differentiates a, a still image from a moving image is the idea of multiple layers. Moving. Parallax. So you can f parallax and the idea of you know foreground, middle ground, and background element yeah. and actually having them move. So you can see that you know the camera is in constant motion which makes you feel that three-dimensionality and it's, that's a great point, Leo, is that most people don't understand that when they move over into film and the camera's not moving and therefore it feels very stale. Right. So, yeah. I, I love the way that you use the snowball uh, running. It, it is the, a trick that 3D filmmakers, right there, yeah, that's typically will use to give it three dimensions. But this is 2D, but it yeah. certainly accomplishes the same the same effect by having planes moving at different rates, effectively. Well, yeah, the snow exactly. definitely adds to it. Yeah. And then think about the, the first AC, which is a, a gentleman whose job it is to pull focus. Oh, my it's God. pulling focus <laughs> at F2 on that snowball. And if you look at oh that shot, he wow. kept perfect focus uh, on that snowball the entire throw, which I find, if my life depended on that, and I grew up as a sports photographer <laughs> shooting a 428 before autofocus, that's how I got my break. But if my life depended on getting this next shot watch right this. here. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. It stays in focus it's, the whole way. It's yeah. insane. The guy had 20 years of, you know, in the business and um, unbelievable work by, by the first AC. So uh, how exciting is it to be working with, I know switching from still to video, you're mm -hmm. working with these enormous teams of exceptionally talented people. How has that journey been for you? There's two sides to it. On the one side, it's the best thing, because you always say whether you're a manager or a photographer or just about anyone, surround yourself with people more talented than you are. And that yep. absolutely applies in filmmaking. You find the best wardrobe person, the best actors, the best art director, the best DP, the best gaffer, et cetera, et cetera, the best script, screenwriters, et cetera. Uh, so that's the one side of it, and that's the part that I love. The, the part that I don't love is that you better be on top of your game, because if you don't know what you're about to do or you're not sure, You've got 100 people staring at you who are well aware that you're not prepared <laughs> or that you aren't quite sure. And uh, that's the beauty and the curse of filmmaking uh, in that as a photographer, you pick up a camera and you run out and you find a beautiful image and you don't know what you're going after. You know, I used to love nothing more than picking my camera with one lens and walking around New York City. That's how I started my career when I was 15. You can't do that as a filmmaker. You can't really get away with that because um, if you make one mistake, let alone 100, 
uh, when it comes time to cutting it together, uh, it's absolutely unforgiving. So everything does have to be planned out. Um, you'll see a lot of directors sitting in director's chairs. They don't do anything. They're just kind of sitting there staring at the monitor with headphones like I am now. And you look at that and go, wow, that's a pretty cool job. I could do that job. Scorsese <laughs> isn't, hasn't moved the whole time. And the reality is Scorsese or Spielberg or Kubrick have done all of their work in pre-production. They've gone through every single wardrobe decision, every single lighting decision, every single camera move decision, so that by the time you're on set, you really should sit back and pay attention to only one thing which is what's going on, the performance uh, on the screen. Because everything else is already, you've already done all that. It's work. too late by then. You can't say, you know yeah, what, yeah. I, I like that, that dress uh, or that, that red colored jacket she was wearing or I don't like her boots three or four shots into it because you've shot three or four shots. You can't go back in time. You can't break continuity. What do you think constitute a great director? Uh, someone who um, has the ability to uh, visually and intellectually and emotionally engage the audience and has a good technical know-how, yet is also a risk taker, an innovator, uh, also understands the importance of great acting, interaction with actors, uh, the use of sound and light and motion, and the list goes on and on and on. So how has going, you started, he started off as a photojournalist, mm -hmm. and so you were telling stories with single images off the time with the New York Times. You only had one spot, one image. Was, you had to learn how to tell a story. So mm -hmm. how has that transition from coming up with storyline through an image to moving pictures, what's applicable from still to video? Well, uh, Reverie is a good example of that. Reverie was shot uh, with 12 hours notice. They gave me a 5D Mark II prototype. <laughs> What? With 12 hours? 12 notice? hours. Could you imagine? How did you get a helicopter? That's what I want to know. <laughs> That's easy. You pick up the phone, you give them your credit card. It's all about uh, money, yeah. So this yeah, is interesting. So this is when the 5D Mark II came out and we found out, oh, it's going to shoot video. But Canon went to you and said, we need an example? Not exactly. Uh, I happened to be at the office when they were receiving the prototypes. And I basically, for four hours straight, um, barraged one of the people to let me borrow it over the weekend. Give it to me, give it to me, give, I, I, it, to give me. it to me. I, I wasn't chosen to do it. And uh, after four hours and on the seventh uh, try, they finally relented and said, take it over the weekend and write us an email on Monday. Oh, Instead, geez. I decided to do this. And um, wow. Reverie yeah. is just a collection of still shots. There's no dialogue. We shot it at night because I had no lighting equipment. I, had, I used a pro photo pack and I used a molding lamp and I used a little light panel. That's all I had. I had uh, one little tripod with fluid head, which was the only video piece of equipment I had. Granted, I had every lens in the world because I was a still photographer, but uh, I kept it very simple uh, and very straightforward. And um, we shot this with 12 hours notice, no manual, uh, one battery, and uh, wow. the most fun production in the world because we had no client waiting on the other end. Right. They just said, you know, call us on Monday and uh, write us an email. I can't tell you. I mean, I remember vividly this. seeing this. In fact, we talked to you shortly after you did it. Uh, and what a revelation it was as to what SLR f video was going to be. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, because you see, oh, my God, depth of field, um, the, the variety of lenses, the low light, the all low light, the things the that you can do too, yeah. with the lenses, the glass you have. It was a revelation, not just to me, I'm sure to every photographer out there that this is a whole new world we're entering right now. Yeah. It, was a sh it was a shock, and me included. When I first saw these images, we didn't have uh, monitors on set. We were working off the little LCD. Uh, so I would go back at home at, at 4 or 5 in the morning at the end of the shoot, because we shot at night, and I would uh, project these or, or play them on my TV for my Apple TV, and my jaw would drop at the quality that I was seeing. <laughs> yeah. And you, you forgot one thing about the formula you gave. It was, it was low light. It was a uh, variety of lenses. Uh, it was... Um, Depth uh, was of the field. Other? Depth of field, exactly. It's the size of the sensor. But the number one thing, too, we can't forget is price. Yeah. All those things have always existed. Yeah. But they were at unattainable prices. You need Panavision people. cameras oh, to yeah. do yeah. You, you couldn't need, do it with a crew. You need a, a, you need a you whole need crew. A, you need a quarter million to a million dollars just to afford the camera. And most yeah. of the yeah. stuff you can't even buy. So that was what I would call the start of the democratization of film. Yes. Uh, you know, was kind of started by this camera, and I happened to be the, uh, the, the happy idiot who was the first guy to shoot, shoot with it. Well, I think, too, it's not just about the accessibility of the gear itself, but I, mean, I know with Hollywood productions, you, you can't hold these cameras on it. You have to have full-on crews 
putting together these well, things. Well, that was so it's cost. interesting because that was the revolution in Hollywood that happened in the 70s was for the first time the cameras were small enough, they were still huge, but that you could take them out of a set and yep. bring them into the field. And we saw it, we got Bonnie and Clyde, we got these, this revolution mm -hmm. uh, because cameras were finally able to leave the studio. Yeah. And this is that next stage that just... Even, I mean, when they shot House, you know, you're shooting in small rooms and you've got the camera in the guy's yeah, yeah, face. Yeah, yeah. You can do things you could never do before. That really is amazing. So you come from a film background. Your, your, your biological father and, and your adopted father both yeah. were in film. What, were they, what did they do? Uh, my dad, uh, Bertrand Laferre, uh, was a set photographer. He worked for Premier Magazine after working for Gamma for 10 years. What as a, a great magazine. I miss that magazine. Oh. Yep. And uh, he, so he would bring me on sets to see Bertolucci films when I was a kid. Oh, you have this. Wow, I'm impressed. How There's Angel the Heart, Mickey Rourke. How did, how did you find that? Oh, that's, we have a research you guys are, team. You guys are, you guys are good. <laughs> um, so that's Bertrand's work, my dad. All, and of course, my, all in film. Yeah, we can thank all Trish for this one. <laughs> yeah, good, good catch. And then uh, my biological dad is uh, Juste Jacquin who directed Emmanuel, which is one of the most famous oh French films my God. that was on the Champs-Élysées for 12 years with the longest run in history. Talk about so, a revelation. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> so uh, it was definitely in my blood. Uh, I got into uh, the Tisch School of the Arts. I got into USC and Northwestern. And instead of going to film school, I chose to go to journalism school because I, at the time I said, you know, I, I really would rather cover reality for a bit to understand that and then perhaps later on go into the uh, the created world of filmmaking, and you can, as you can see there. So I heard your dad was kind of harsh. <laughs> yes, he was. Um, so um, one of the stories that Catherine and I spoke about was um, kind of my upbringing as a photographer. First of all, Bertrand Lafray did not want me to become a photographer because I was he's French. You know, my family's all French, um, and they did, they were seeing me as living the American dream, going to North Northwestern. And their point was, don't, don't do what is, in effect, a very difficult job of photography. There's a lot of competition. It's hard to make a living. You travel, blah, blah, blah. Become a doctor. Become a lawyer. And I was like, I have no interest in that. So um, what he would do is I would, I would go there for the summer to France, and I would hand him my 30 best slides. And I would give, he would take the 30 best slides from the month. He would stack 10 up on the left, 20 up on the right. And keep in mind, Bertrand's a very kind man. We've had one fight in our entire life together. So he's not a hard ass, if you will, if you excuse me. I, I hope I'm not, uh, you know, killing any ratings here. But he, he opened his drawer slowly, pulled out a pair of scissors, and went right through the 20 slides that uh, he thought were either out of focus or poorly exposed. And, that's, not a, um, that's not a bad thing, though. I mean, I think that's... Oh, it traumatized me because... It gets uh, your it, attention. It took, it took me Wait, how old years. were you during this? What age? I was 16. 16. That's kind of hard. You're a teenager. But it sounds like a story we heard, though, a couple of weeks ago. Same thing, which is, this is crap. And yep. sometimes you need to hear, this is crap. Yep. Well, how, did this, how did this affect you? you said there was positive and negative that came out of this. The positive is that I became an extremely technical photographer. So at 16 or 17, I could, um, I, it's fair to say, because this is how my career started, I shot better exposed chrome and sharper images than the huge percentage of professional photographers because I was obsessive about it. I mean, I would sit in my closet with a self-timer uh, with Chrome and do uh, EV correction tests with strobes. So I would know exactly what minus one-third was, minus two-thirds. This is before we had LCDs. So you have to learn the hard way. You have to sit in your closet with some, you know, signs and uh, learn how the strobe would work and how you could balance stuff out, turn the Chrome in and get them back a few days later or a week later. So I was obsessive technically. I was obsessive with sharp images, which led me to, during my college years, uh, being one of the few guys who could shoot with a 4 2.8 and manually focus before autofocus was out. And that effectively started my career. So that was the positive part. I've always been very technical. I've always understood the technical jargon that's helped me work with you know, Apple and Canon and you know, other companies like that. The negative of it is that when you become so obsessed with technique, mm. you become very anal and you yeah. want every single frame to be perfect. And um, I used to look at blurry images or motion blur and go, poo, 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 you know, the guy doesn't know what he's doing or the, theme, you know, the woman photographer doesn't know what she's doing. And the problem is that a lot of times I did connect emotionally with those images and I couldn't quite understand why, even though they were technically flawed and that meant that a scissor should go through it and, and destroy them, 
uh, that they still resounded. And uh, the reality is uh, it's about finding that balance between being very technical, um, you know, really focusing on the four edges of your frame and, you know, your, your depth of field and all the exposure, all that fun stuff or not fun stuff. And uh, also letting go a little bit, letting it loose. And in fact, my, uh, my biological dad has told me, he, you know, he told me uh, recently that he really appreciates my work. He, he'd like to see a little more craziness for his exact words <laughs> in, in, my photo in, my, in my work, in my photography and filmmaking. That damn so Bertrand I, yeah. with his scissors every time he shut you yeah. down. <laughs> exactly. You know, so I've got one, one guy, you know, filming nude women and the other guy who's super technical. So, but it's good. To, it, you, you, that's such a good story. And it really does. You do need the technique, but you also need the freedom of an artist uh, yes. to express. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And, and sometimes perfect technique gets in the way of emotion or... Or Absolutely. Expression. Well, I think that. Have, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. When you have that eight by ten field camera that you can't move, yeah. that shoots an incredibly uh, perfectly exposed huge negative. Uh, the beauty of it is technically it could be absolutely fantastic. The reality is you might miss the moment, uh, or you know the uh, the point of the photograph is so perfect technically that it doesn't have any soul. That's the danger. Well, your work strikes me as having you know I said for the video it's poetic and it has so much depth to it. How did you go from that sort of focused on technique to telling an emotional, visual, engaging story? Um, I had good editors and teachers and uh, I saw a tremendous amount of weakness in my work when I started off actually. Uh, I was very unhappy with it and I'm just now three, three plus years into it starting to be happy with what I'm shooting. Uh, the famous footwear commercial was one of the first ones that I was like, okay, finally, this is somewhere where I'd like to be. Because um, you got to realize I had, I had almost 20 years as a photographer, and I'm still only three and a half years in the video. And, um, you know, there's, there's a big contrast there, right? It's, it's there. Um, so uh, there's no substitute for experience and time and learning, no matter who you are. And uh, the reality is you can be the best um, photographer in the world, quote, unquote. I'm not talking about myself. Uh, I'm just saying that anyone who picked the best photographer in the world, that does not make them a good filmmaker because uh, the visual uh, is one of the most painful things to learn and learn to respect. Uh, the visual takes the second seat to the content yeah. and the acting and the story. Uh, you can have the most amazing visuals and maybe if you're shooting Baraka, you'll get away with it. I don't know if you guys have seen Baraka, but it's one of the most amazing, amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, you know, nature films. And my friend Tom Lowe is working on a film called Timescapes right now on, on the American West, which is going to be fantastic. But I don't care how beautiful uh, a, a Micro Bay film is or some, some, you know, really amazing special effects film. The reality is if there's no story and no content, it's mind numbing. Well, there's where your photojournalistic background must help. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's... We're looking at pictures you did for the New York Times on New Orleans. Uh, that exactly. these, these are this is photojournalism, yes. and yeah, gorgeous photos also. I mean, that was always my struggle, or my my uh, my goal as a photojournalist was to try to marry the aesthetic with content. Yeah. So there's two extremes. There's a beautiful picture of a sunset with no real meaning. It still has value, but it's got to be a really darn good sunset to catch my attention. <laughs> right. Or there's an incredible news situation. Let's say Eddie Adams' photograph of the Viet Cong being executed on the street. That's not very visually striking, but the content is, is so uh, you know, powerful that it changes the course of a war. The reality is on an everyday basis as a photojournalist, you've got to be somewhere in between because you've got to, you've got to catch your audience's eye. Uh, in the paper. I love this picture of this house because the, the, how the, the, the limb of the branch echoes the shape of the house and frames it. Um, it's telling a story. It's photojournalism. And yet you, you obviously composed it and beautifully. Well, you know, in, in situations like this, the house isn't going anywhere. So you have time. You can move you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunately landed on top of the truck. And um, this is shot with a tilt shift lens. So you have time here. Uh, and you, you should take the time. Yeah. Whereas when you're a photojournalist running around in live situations, it's significantly more complicated. More difficult. In different ways. So, I mean, you obviously jumped from still to video, and you're, you're isolated in the video world right now. You're not doing too much still. What, right. What's your advice for photographers out there that are attempting to do both? Um, hmm. I, I or honestly, don't do both. Is that your advice? Well, no, see, I don't like to tell people what to do, first of all. Good. Uh, and second of all, uh, there is no perfect answer. My, the easy answer is choose one. 
um, and focus on it. But then that would kind of be like, well, you know, why close the door on people inventing new hybrid ways of communicating, which excites me just as much with the marriage of photography and video. Uh, the reality is that they just need to understand uh, what I learned, which is what I, you know, first of all, we all have an incredible understanding of filmmaking because we've all been watching TV and films our whole lives. It is. Lives. It's okay. in our DNA now, It's isn't in it? our DNA. It's a shared language, mm -hmm. just as, a, as any, it, it, all around the world. And, and it's a shared language uh, that's in, ingrained in us, whether we're aware of it or not. Uh, it's the same way as a photograph is, perspective lines you're seeing here, uh, rep repetition geometry, um, reflections, you know, all those things are ingrained in us. And um, that being said, the best thing you can do as you become a filmmaker or try to become a filmmaker uh, is hit the pause button and rewind. And so when you see a scene that's particularly effective, just as you would try to break down a photograph you see in a magazine or a book, I used to look at you know the, the specular spots in the person's eye on a portrait yeah. to figure out how many lights were there and yeah. break it down. Look at the shadow, try to figure out what light was used. You need to break it down to an even greater level as a as a filmmaker and say, why was this lens chosen versus a wider or a tighter lens? Why was the camera moving in this direction? And also, most importantly, why did they go from this shot to the next shot to the next shot to the next shot? A film is a sequence of shots, and how they marry it together uh, takes the audience on a journey. So uh, there's almost a rule that I've made to myself as a filmmaker is if I try to make every single shot a picture-perfect shot, it's too much and it won't work and it won't flow. You've got to have your, your, your key shots, and in between you've got to have the shots that are transitionary and get you from A to B. Um, otherwise, um, you'll get something that's more like Reverie, which is you know a little bit disjointed and it's pretty, but it doesn't flow like when you see a, you know, a fantastic uh, Coen Brothers film or something like that. So it's film is about the collective pieces coming together for a greater whole, not the individual shots. Well, I guess going on the question, the initial question, I think the thing that's hard for me as a photographer is I'm so busy and so overwhelmed just with Photoshop and Lightroom and mm -hmm. my still camera or my Mark II, just shooting still. How, I mean... I, I can't go into the video world and I feel stunted by that because I just don't have the time because I know it's going to take so much investment of time with editing software and shooting video. I mean, is it realistic and how do you balance that? There's no need for you to learn to edit. That's where, the reason they have people called editors. You know, <laughs> I got a lot more about editing than you do and you, that's the best recommendation I have for anyone going into this is to work with an editor because they'll teach you very quickly what mistakes you made when you shot, you know, how you forgot about this coverage or you... You mess this up. We don't have this continuity going here. Uh, so don't worry about learning how to edit. That's, you know, it, you do ultimately need to know how to edit to become a better director. Uh, but you can learn all that just by sitting down and uh, on a, an edit session because the editor will tell you, oh, that was a stupid mistake you just made there. Or I don't have a shot to cut to. Um, that being said, one of the best advice, uh, or pieces of advice that I have for people is um, learn to shoot films with your iPhone. Uh, it doesn't, wow. don't get all boggled into the steady cam, this, this rack focus, that. Because ultimately, the most important building blocks of a film is how something cuts. And if you can shoot, I bet you, you give uh, the Coen brothers or Kubrick an iPhone, they can uh, shoot a film without uh, actually cutting anything shot by shot because they have it all in here. And they know how to transition. That's the most important part. And then you get worried about, you know, filters and steady cams, fluid heads, and all that. So literally, I would just say, shoot with your iPhone, cut an iMovie uh, on your phone or whatever you know software you want, and start to learning, learn the more important building blocks of uh, editing, and then you can get fancy. Or, Catherine, to be quite honest, edit, uh, filmmaking is not for everybody. It's a very different uh, mindset uh, than photography. Photography is more of a, 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 a solitary person's pursuit who likes to go out into the world, uh, doesn't really know what's going to happen, has some plans. You know, obviously a commercial photographer is going to be much more different than a photojournalist. But for me, my background as a photojournalist, I, I love going out having no idea what I would find that day. Whereas a filmmaker is all about a lot of pre-production, a lot of phone calls, conference calls, uh, decisions, paperwork. And by the time you land on set, you hope it all comes together. But it's a collaborative process. You have to get along with people. You have to raise funds. Um, it's it's a very different type of personality. Yeah, that's why when I go home, I don't I don't want to do video. I I want to do I want to be by myself, take pictures, and enjoy that process. 
Because uh, we spend the other collaborative time here, of course. Yeah. yeah. Our guest, Vincent LaForay, this is so much fun, and uh, we got more to talk about. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about all the gear you use and the technology you use, because you really seem to have a, a, a real fix on cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, but we'll do that in a second. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about one of the most important things for any photographer, which is making backups. You cannot afford to lose those images, let alone your financial records, the baby pictures, movies, music, all the things on your hard drive. Every hard drive has one thing, and all hard drives have one thing in common. They all fail at some point, and Carbonite is there to get it back. I just read, uh, Carbonite told me that 7 billion, you know, that's 7 billion files that would have been lost forever, maybe a few great pictures in there. Um, if you are looking for a good backup solution that backs up your data, uh, it does it online so you don't have to worry about anything just go to carbonite.com right now fill out the uh, offer code twit photo and you can try it free for two weeks no credit card needed it's a true free trial and then if you decide to buy the flat rate is really what gets me on carbonite no matter how much data you have it's less than five bucks a month for all the personal data on your internal drive mac or pc use the offer code twit photo to try it use the offer code twit photo to buy it you'll get 14 months for the price of twelve. Fifty nine dollars for fourteen months. Carbonite dot com. It's backup done right. Sometime we've got to get Peter Krogh on here to talk about his uh three two one backup strategy and all of that. Yeah. DP bestflow dot org is his site for all that. So you get the toys, Vincent. Jeez Louise. Are you you yeah. doing some are you doing stuff with Epic with Red? Absolutely. Uh, I, you, I, I'm not sure. I don't remember what you called it before, but I would call it a disease almost. Um, <laughs> it's an illness. It's an, yeah. it's an, it's an illness. Yeah. It's an obsession. Oh, yeah. um, I have a very hard time. It's like a kid with crack when someone says, do you want to try this out? It's like, <coughs> I really, excuse me, I really don't have time to do it, but sure. Um, and so I've, I, I got so many requests via email on my blog. Um, you know, a few million people visit a, a, a year and, um, I got really tired of saying you should buy this camera versus that camera. So I actually listed every single piece of gear that I've used uh, on this. If you go ahead and this click on This is the best it. gear page I have ever seen in my oh, life. Click on the links. That's like, Oops. Oh. Thank you. Not that link. Okay, wait a minute. I, I screwed that one up. Let's click on custom configurations here. So there you go. You've, you've done video. You did video with it. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually will talk you through why uh, I use this uh, and, and show you examples. If you go back, uh, click on lenses. So go back one level. Um, go down a little bit. There you go. I love lenses. I love glass. Instead I... of just showing you the lenses I use, I actually tell you when I use them and show oh, you examples. Good. And I compare different lenses and, and talk about their pros and cons. And I figured that would keep all the emails at bay. Um, <laughs> and um, No, it just stimulates it, it more, actually, I'm sure. <laughs> it act, it, no, it actually has worked. You know, oh, it's, it's probably the, the most popular destination. It is the most popular destination of the blog. And um, well, and a note for uh, struggling photographers: this is a good way to make money, because mm -hmm. I'm sure the links to a BNH have affiliate fees, right? Well, California, yeah. there were banned in California on now. Amazon, not BNH. No, both. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. son so, of a. I know. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. it's such a great, it's such an amazing resource. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I know you do it for a lot of reasons, but I just want to point out that. Uh, it's okay to pay attention to how to make money doing the thing you love. Just move out of California for yeah, a lot of reasons if you want to make money. Apparently. <laughs> uh, so, look at these lenses. Now you just make me want to buy lenses. Do you have a favorite, like, I mean, how do you pick a favorite with the, with this? But Ooh, 24 millimeter f Favorite F1. lens. Ooh. Like, go-to lens? Mm. Nope. Nope. I, I, uh, I, if I had to pick one lens, um, this would make Canon upset, but I would just say I'd, I'd take a Leica M9 with a 35 millimeter, yeah. Leica F2. That's yeah. that's what I'd want to go yep. somewhere with. Uh, but uh, if I had to pick a Canon, it would probably be uh, a Canon 5D Mark II uh, with probably 35.14 or 24.14. You like it a little bit wide. I do uh, because of my photo drills and roots. You can always walk closer to something, granted, yep. it has some distortion. Whereas a 50 is fantastic for filmmaking. But it's a little bit tight for uh, the everyday. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I uh, I couldn't afford an M9. That's why I got that X100. But it's uh, it's still a oh. it's a fun camera. I, I shoot 90% of my personal photographs with my iPhone, and the other 10% are almost 100% with the M9. Yeah. Six thousand dollars, something like that. Six or seven, yeah. <laughs> but a great camera. <laughs> what do you do with your iPhone photos? 
Um, I I tweet them and uh, I I back them up six times over. But uh, <laughs> you, I'm, a, I'm a big big fan of Camera Plus. Oh, actually, going you use off Camera that. Plus. No kidding. All the, all the time. Yeah. That's great. Well, Lisa will be very happy to hear that. You do have your own app too, though. Yeah, I have I it on here. Check this out. This is neat. If you want to know more about Vincent and his photographs, it's called Visuals by Vincent LaFore. Uh, $2.99. And then he's got images and, and the explanation of the tools he used, wh you know, why he did what he did. There's videos. There's 69 videos that go yeah. that he great. walks you through. So it shows you Talk all the settings. A learning tool. Um, so that, that was the hidden treasure of this. If you click on video. The video, video is the coolest part. Yeah, you get to see my ugly face and, um, you know, ignore the reviews. Um, no oh, those oh, reviews are silly. Yeah. But well, no, no, no. It's a good lesson because I put this app out as a free app initially. And a lot of people downloaded it and said, what does it do? It's not Camera Plus. I'm and not they didn't connected get it. to the Internet. They, they thought they, it was got, for taking pictures. Yeah, or doing something with the images. And, and in reality, it was meant to be more of an educational tool. You can see all the uh, metadata up there, what lens was used. And then when you click on the video and you have Internet, you can actually um, hear me talk about I do two different parts to every photograph. One is the story behind the image, oh, and then B, the technical behind it and why I shot it. And, uh, and of course, you can use it as a wallpaper. You can buy fine art prints and all that fun stuff. Oh, it's, that's neat. So you get it the image the cool, itself. That's yeah. Cool. It makes yes, it cool for all levels, it. too. Because, you know, as yeah. a pro, I'm not as interested in the metadata information. But right. the video is very insightful. I, so. I thought so, and uh, you can share with other people. Um, you can save all of them as wallpapers and uh, share them with other people. So iPhone or be, iPad know. too, which is really nice. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Carry it around with. Do you, you have any of the Pulitzer Prize winning? Uh, someone uh, just asked in the chat room. Yes, he yeah. was on a Pulitzer Prize winning team. Is this mm -hmm. from? No, they're not in there. They were from Pakistan. And I thought they were just a little too dark to to add mm. in an iPhone app for the first one. Got it. Yeah. I love this image. What's your favorite gear out there right now? Are you, you're doing some, you mentioned the time-lapse stuff. What is mm -hmm. this, what, this, this Kessler time-lapse system? Tell me about this. So uh, I've been working with Eric Kessler, and he's got a new, a next-generation system. But basically, for those of you doing time-lapse, it's um, time-lapse on crack. And, um, <laughs> you know, there's nothing more boring to me than a time-lapse video uh, with the camera uh, stationary. In fact, if you scroll down a little bit, go ahead and... Um, and uh, you'll Ooh, see is that wait uh, wait can we actually be quiet and listen to that video the timescapes and time fest is that showing what we're talking about no there's a better one i think oh, okay. this, this one's a 20 minute video so let me stop oh, that which yeah. one should we look so, at keep, keep scrolling down leo and click on on uh the one ju you just passed by this one here right there yeah the dark one all right yeah and uh, I'll talk over it. But basically, the idea is, you know, anyone can do time lapse because you ooh, just stick a camera ooh, ooh. still somewhere, <laughs> and you can, that's the crane ooh. going up over time with ooh. the stars on the on the center. If you look carefully, on the left is a dog. Oh, wow. this, this oh. is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually were playing with a Kessler at CES. I think we had the, yeah. it moves the camera while it's doing the time lapse. Exactly, and you can see how they were following the uh, sky. So uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous amount of fun because you just use the existing 5D or still camera that you have with your existing lenses. You buy this uh, slider or this crane and you add little motors to it. And the best part about time-lapse photography is once you hit go, you can't do anything. You just sit around, you wait for two, three, four, drink. five, six hours. Do you drink hours. beers? What do you do during this time? <laughs> drink, drink, drink beers, basically, and you, you commiserate with friends on top of the most beautiful places on Earth. So oh. uh, Eric got myself and uh, a dozen other uh, fantastic uh, uh, people together. Look at that! And and uh, we had a blast. We got to hang out, do some really nice time lapse, and um, it was our first little reunion. This was in the uh, in uh, the near uh, between Model Lake and Lake Ta uh, not Lake Tahoe. I'm sorry, um, still getting used to California. Uh, Mammoth Lakes. There you go. And uh, you know, really it's a fun, beautiful landscape. What's really your favorite fun. recent toy that's come out? I've got to say it's the Epic. Uh, oh, this is so a camera. Tight. That's a toy. <laughs> oh, so it's a massive it's toy. It, What's it's, the resolution on that thing? It's 5K, which is uh, Five. Uh, quite a few times the resolution That's of 1080. Insane. So HD is 2K. Almost 2K. Almost 2K. 4K is doubling it in horizontally and vertically. And then the folks at, uh, at Oakley said, at Red said, people, will, are, you know, quibbling over the 4k thing it's not really 4k so they made it 5k they said yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. We'll make it 5K. <laughs> now quibble. Unbelievable. Well, I don't know how you play it back, but unbelievable. The amazing part, Leo, is, you know, you look, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, you and Catherine love to stare at someone's photographs or your photographs yep. and the beauty, the, the physical quality. When you stare at a red image and you pause it, it's like looking at a still image. So yep. this thing is able to yeah, shoot um, 120 frames per second at the equivalent of, of a 14 megapixel still camera. Wow. And it's shooting raw, which is insane. So uh, if you guys want to go to my blog later, there's, there's an article there that actually shows a photograph of a young girl. And you can zoom in and actually see the reflection uh, of the window in her eye. So it feels like mm. you, are, uh, you are seeing um, uh, Blade Runner. The detail is amazing. You own it's, this camera too, right? You just actually I got do it. Own, I bought it. I, oh. I just broke down and bought it. And uh, I could have bought a BMW instead. Well, you you know you could. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but would it have made you? That as wouldn't happy? be nearly as fun. No. Well, you can rent it too, right? I mean, you can make no, some absolutely. of the money that's back. The, that's the big thing with uh, with video is you really should try and rent as much as you can because they don't you know they don't pop these out like rebels right. uh, you know and so they're obviously significantly more expensive. So rent it for the day or week that you need it and then return it. And we should tell anybody who's watching. Of course, you're not seeing anywhere near the actual quality even on Vimeo. Uh, no. You have to go to Vincent's house yeah. if you yes. really want to see what this looks like because you can't display 5K. Exactly. Is that an invitation, Vincent? <laughs> you have to go to Red Studios, actually, which is an invitation, and they have a 4K projector. And when oh. you see that, uh, I had a bunch of uh, people from Adobe there, and their jaws just dropped. It's uh, because it's, it's, it's imagine your 14 megapixel images right. at 120 frames per second. It's insane. We saw, when we were at CES, uh, we went to the Red booth, and they had a, a vi movie that they'd shot, uh, and, and, and they had the 4K projector. And it is yep. a different experience. And I've always said, I said, forget 3D. Just give us 4K displays yeah, because it's oh, like yeah. looking through a window. It's so real. That's yep. true reality. You know, that's really giving you an amazing... Your eye and brain will make that 3D just fine. It's amazing. And, ca and Canon uh, showed some of their 4K and yeah. 8K screens at the uh, Canon Expo this year. Yep. So uh, they're on the horizon. And man, when you look at them, it's like looking through a window. Everybody's doing it. Sony's doing it. Um, this is the future for sure. Yeah. Yep. But Red, but thank, you know, I praise to Red because when I remember when they announced this, I, we all yeah. mocked them. We yes. thought they can't do that. They're with, and the, but they did it. Yeah, me included. I was not a fan initially, and then when the Epic came out, I just did a complete reversal. Yeah, unbelievable. And it's, the si it's the size of a Hasselblad. It's heavy. I was just about to ask, how heavy but is it? it? If you, you know, you can use Canon lenses on it with a with a right mount, um, so you can go right into that. You don't have to buy a bunch of city lenses, That's and so it's neat. basically, uh, you know, uh, three times the, the weight of a Hasselblad, but the same same size. N5 GM is asking an interesting question in the chat room. At this point, why not just shoot video and pull out stills at that wedding or at that sporting event? You know, because that's, you're going to get stills that are as good, uh, but you get all of the images. Especially at that resolution. With at weddings, resolution, you don't need and higher. Also, and also, you, you, at 120 frames a second, it's very forgiving on motion, so you don't have to stabilize as much. Oh, perfect. And um, with that kind of 5K resolution, you can use a warp stabilizer in, in CS5 five in uh, After Effects to really stabilize images. So... Uh, it's a new dawn of filmmaking with this kind of resolution, for sure. That would be good for my reputation show, a wedding with the red camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd have to do quite a few weddings to pay for it. <laughs> I'll yes. just rent it from Vin Vincent. <laughs> so you I mean, have a, lo a love-hate relationship with Garrett. Can you explain that a little further? Because I'm hearing the love side. <laughs> the love side is that uh, gear can um, really help you attain an image or uh, a shot. Uh, this goes to like one of my tips, I guess I could speak to that, which is um, one of I have two two sayings that uh, I try to live by that I never do. Um, one is K I S S. Keep it uh, simple. Keep it stupid. simple, stupid. Yep. And uh, the other is just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> um, so just because you can bring every lens and the kitchen sink with you out into the field, because I do own most of them. Um, you realize that you're a walking Christmas tree and you can't move, you become lazy, you immobilize yourself, um, you can't reach the right camera, the right lens, you're missing pictures left and right because you physically can't hike up the hill to get the picture, you can't get on your knees because right. you're going to be able to get back up. And uh, having too much gear will kill you. Here's a um, picture of a 3D microphone. Now this thing is also super cool. This uh, is some of the most immersive audio I've ever heard uh, you know, outside of a Hollywood movie. 
and it's a uh, it's a uh, under a thousand dollar microphone. I have a little coupon code on my site if you guys want to use it. Uh, you get uh, a nice little percentage off, and um, it's you have to wear headphones, and you'll hear the sound. It's night and day. It's fantastic for people who are doing time lapses or want to pick up what we call nat sound, environmental sound. We have to play it's, with this, yeah. Yeah, you have to play with this. For very sure. intriguing. Yeah. yeah, look at that. So that's the traditional shotgun mic. It's a mono mic, and then uh, you know when you guys get a chance to hear the video, it's just it's night and day. Well, it's interesting because I mean, your uh, photographers tend to be so visual. Yes. Uh, and I guess you have to would start thinking about audio when you're doing movies when you're doing yep. yeah yeah we, we were given more than one sense so that of yeah. sight yeah. we were given you know smell touch uh vision uh hearing and i'm, I'm sure i'm missing one but the, the point we is we don't have smell yet thank god <laughs> yes indeed especially when rambo or schwarzenegger are on screen <laughs> i see your beatles sign are you a big music lover uh i i am actually uh, I share it in this really cool collective studio, and the, the guy next door uh, prints all, licenses all this artwork of oh, different okay. artists. And uh, I am a, a definitely a music fan. Now, just, that's interesting, because, Vincent, of course, you're big time. You could have your own studio. You could have, you know, I mean, you decided to work in a collaborative environment. Well, it is it is my studio, and he just lives <laughs> next door. <laughs> oh, okay. But, I, mean, but, uh, I do have an upstairs neighbor, and um, but you I like, like to have the people around you while you're working. Absolutely, I mean it's it, you go bounce off ideas. My upstairs neighbor, we're going to go see someone at Sony on Friday because he knows someone there to pitch something. There's nothing, there's no negative to it, and uh, you know sometimes you want peace and quiet, but other times you um, you want to have people around so it doesn't get too lonely. You can Not close the door good. and lock it though. That's important. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's take a break. We uh, so much fun talking to Vincent. Vincent Lafore at blog.vincentlafore.com. V i n c e n t l a f o r e t. For those of you listening on audio, um, and we will talk more with Vincent in just a little bit. Sounds good. And get some more tips from him. Yeah. But first, a tip for you: the best deal. Thank you, Tony. The best deal in uh, entertainment when you're done for the day and you want to just veg out and watch great cinema or great TV shows, or even crappy TV shows. They have Emmanuel, by the way. That's in the former category, not the latter. Netflix.com slash twit. Netflix streaming is fantastic. You don't have to plan ahead. You just, you just go to Netflix, and you can watch on your iPhone, on your iPad, on your Xbox 360, on your PlayStation 3. The streaming is such a great deal, too. $7.99 a month for all you can eat. Oh, I just, you know, I recently was on a jury, so I've been watching courtroom ah, dramas. I can't believe you picked this one. I just watched uh, The Hustler with Paul Newman. Ah, he is uh, so the great. The other night. This yeah. is, I highly recommend The Verdict. He plays a washed-up lawyer who gets one last unlosable case. It's very dramatic. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, it's so much fun. And, and, and really, any way, Mad Men, talk about a very a visually beautiful, interesting show. Um, I love Mad Men. Yeah, because it, it's very visual, isn't it's it? It's very visual. And stylized. Someone told me that it was slow, and I was like, I don't even notice that it's slow because I, there's so much eye candy. Well, it's funny. There's a show on another network, the show will remain nameless, that synopsizes TV shows. And I read a plot synopsis of, the Ma of Mad Men. It was like, that is exactly the least important thing <laughs> yeah, yeah, on yeah. Mad Men. You don't care about the plot. You care about how it looks You care feels. about the, the... It's all style, yeah. baby. Well, Raging Bull, what a great, talk about great black and white cinematography. If you, oh, this is just, you know, this is, can, this is a candy store, and all of these are available. And you can watch junk films, too. You know, if you're in the mood to watch a Texas funeral, <laughs> you can watch it with Martin Sheen. You can watch it, and, and, and no one is the wiser. Hank and Mike, two beer-swilling, cigarette-smoking Easter bunnies forced to brave the cold world of unemployment. See, that's the kind of thing I might watch 10 minutes of just in case. Yeah. And you've lost nothing. Type, Se type in Brazil. This oh. is one of Vincent's favorites. Brazil is, well, is you're, a Terry, you're a Terry Gilliam fan. Your dad, of course, shot Munchausen stills. Mm -hmm. This is one of the great films of all time. Now, it's not available on streaming. You have to get the DVD of this. And I would get the Blu-ray if you're going to do that. I agree yeah, with I'm you. Sure. Amazing. It's amazing. You have to watch the film five times before you start to understand it. Robert De Niro is the crazy air conditioning repair man who comes in on zip line. Catherine Hellman uh, as the uh, Bob Hoskins and of course Michael Palin. You're obviously a uh, Monty Python fan. 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Anyway, Netflix, seven ninety nine. I know you're a member. I don't know why yes. we even do these ads. Everybody's a member. There's nobody who's watching who's not a member. So do me a favor. Help us out Expose on the show. Expose other people. Tell other people. Go down the, sh <laughs> go down the street shouting, Netflix.com slash twit. Yeah. Just do a, a little. Well, a little this something. actually segues perfect because Vincent uses movies a lot to learn. Oh, yeah. So, Vincent, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, I think I touched on it a little bit earlier, which is just that, you know, once you find a scene that moves you, um, pause, rewind, and play it back. And, and see dissect. why. Yeah, and storyboard it. You should actually storyboard it as if though you were directing the, the, the film yourself and say, oh, had I chosen a wider angle lens mm. or had I shot from the profile versus head on, it's all different psychology. It's, it's called cinematic language. And the way you move the camera, when you move the camera, why you move the camera, how you deliver the line, and, and back to Mad Men, that's all set design, uh, yes. art direction. It's all, eight, and our, all art direction. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's just fantastic. And wardrobe as well, and, and props. That's what is the filmmaking team. If you, you, know, you, you don't have that in Mad Men, you don't have Mad Men. That's nothing. Yeah. That's true. So, any other and, That and Don Draper. Yeah, Don Draper. <laughs> well, and, and the girls, the ladies. What's the yeah, redhead John, name? Oh, 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 she's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And um, Betty. Anyway, Betty. Betty's yeah. great, too. Betty's yeah. great. So, what Her other movies one. should people uh, could people look to for inspiration? Uh, I'll give you an eclectic. I mean, if you haven't seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, a, a, a kind of a classic. Uh, Do you consider Bruce, Spielberg a, a great filmmaker? Absolutely, because he is single-handedly been able to reach more people on more levels than most directors. Well, that's uh, successful, but do you consider him artistically great? Absolutely. Yeah, Schindler's List, uh, The Color true. Purple yeah. uh, are fantastic okay. films. Um, uh, uh, Saving Private Ryan. Um, Technically, hey, he is amazing. Uh, there's a good Jaws. example. Jaws. Jaws? I mean, yeah. come on. Even I Super know. 8 was pretty amazing. He didn't direct it, but he produced it. it, was, it right. He's been the executive producing a lot of films yeah, lately. Yeah. I've heard he doesn't enjoy directing as much. That's the guy, though, that I've spoken to a lot of people who work with him, walks on set and knows exactly yeah. what he wants. He knows exactly what the camera needs to do. He's able to communicate to his crew very clearly and concisely, and he shoots the rehearsal and rarely shoots more than two or three takes. Interesting. Oh, interesting. That's, that's nothing. Vincent has a great workshop on HDLR, SLR, HD DSLR Cinema. You might want to check out on his uh, on his website um, all sorts of interesting stuff, videos on, for instance, moving from still to video and so forth. Um, this is great. You do you do so much education stuff. I just mm -hmm. think it's fantastic. This blog is such a great resource. Yeah, yeah. So should we launch into your tips? The tips. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So we we already touched on this. Just because you can doesn't Don't. mean <laughs> <laughs> doesn't mean you should. We talked about that one. I like this one a lot, actually. Choose your lens based on compression and foreground to background ratios. So I think the worst thing that Canon and Nikon and Minolta ever did was to print those little things you see at the, uh, the camera store with, um, you know, the, the, uh, the bell tower. And they show you what it looks like with a 20 versus 50 versus an 85 versus a 600. You got that um, exact image on your website. Well, no, hold on. Um, I think people miss... Mis are misguided when they choose a long lens versus a wide angle lens um, just because the subject is further or closer you know to you uh, the point being telephoto lenses compress uh, subjects together they compress information they make two people that are you know 10 feet apart look like they're on top of each other uh, whereas a wide angle will exaggerate the foreground and uh, make the person in the background either disappear or look very small in other words, I choose my lenses based on that compression, based on how I, here's exactly what I was hoping you'd get to. We did a really silly video with Vimeo with Blake Whitman that talks about this. And, you know, as you choose a lens, understand that each lens is not just a random focal length with a certain millimeter rating. It actually has very clear optical uh, properties. So if you shoot a portrait with a 60 millimeter lens, um, even, uh, uh, you know, uh, Carmen Electra will look terrible, whereas if you shoot with a longer lens, it's much more flattering. So we do this really silly <laughs> series of videos. This is great, print. though, because you're right. I just I keep thinking, of, oh, it has to do with Zoom. No, it doesn't. It has yeah. nothing to do with Zoom. <laughs> no, no, Zoom Zoom with your, your feet, not with your lens. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you're at a sporting event, and you obviously can't walk out onto the field during the World Series, so you do need a longer lens. 
But for most of us, uh, our lens choice should be based on that compression and distortion. So distortion could be your friend, most of the time it's your enemy, uh, and compression is the same thing. So here I am with a 16 millimeter lens, and towards the end of this, you'll see the 200 millimeter lens. And so it's how the distant and near objects are squished together that really that's what we're talking about? To me, that's why you choose one lens over the other. Uh, obviously, there's caveats when it's super far away, you've got to go with a super tall photo. When right. you're in a very small room, you have to go with a wide angle. But I, I'd like to suggest people start thinking about lensing more in terms of compression. I love that. Yeah, I, li I like zoom with your feet. You knew this mm -hmm. already, Catherine, I'm sure. Well, it took me a while, actually. to. I mean, I, I definitely know it, but it didn't come because you're kind of trained to think otherwise. This is, I'm I'm Because like you I'm said, closer, that's I'm the farther. material yeah. that's put out I'm there. I'm wider, I'm narrower, not yeah. how the objects within the shot are compressed. Yeah, and then you learn like certain lenses are better, more flattering. Like, for example, the mm -hmm. 85 one for mm -hmm. portraits is just like that magic compression moment right. for pictures of people, you know? So, but it, it is that it's not intuitive, you know? And so I'm glad that he brought this up. It's really um, good. And you know, a lot of people ask a lot of gear questions and I think that's a really great resource, this this video. Then so I loved your reaction to doing this, how he was like, oh, he thought it was gonna be super boring to talk about. No, oh, we this, lost may him. Be, this may be fundamental to talk about. That's what's interesting. Yeah, we lost him. And of course, they make it fun by being Vikings and astronauts. Well, I think that I they, they, they <laughs> initially he's like, oh my God, you're going to make me talk about gear. But this he is made such it an important thing to learn. I think this is really uh, great. So if you can go back to the shot, Tony, because there's actually. Let's show a little more of this while we're while we're getting him back here. He, he might many, have lost his internet. Not so many Hollywood directors would do this. You go by that. on a on a <laughs> razor scooter. <laughs> Hey, there is a huge amount on the site, vincentfootlaforet.com, uh, uh, of learning in there that probably everybody who aspires to be a photographer should just read and understand because uh, regardless of the Viking helmets, this is great stuff. Great stuff. Really interesting stuff. Well, we're going to see if we can get him back here. If we can, we'll... Uh, I can read it. So you knew that you knew this. Did you knew, know it because experientially you realized it, or did somebody say to you, Catherine? Let me tell you, don't worry about the the length of your lens. Worry about the compression of your subject. I think you learn through trial and error. You do. You realize. But I also feel like another thing that we're not thinking about that has something to do with lens choice is how close you like to be with your subject. Right. So there are certain people, like photojournalists, that maybe in a sensitive environment where you they want to be... They want a longer lens. They, you well, don't he said be that. Seen. There are exceptions. If you're in sports or you can't get so close. You, I, I think that's the other time that you, you choose your lens choice based on your right. working style. So, for example, with me... My one of my favorite lenses is 24 to 70 because I like being close with right. my subjects. I like uh, like I kind of like to be in their face. I've noticed that with the X100, which is a pretty wide. I think it's 24 effective. Yeah. Um, so but you do have to get in closer, but you kind of want that for street photography or person. You want sometimes because traditionally good. you think 85, a little distant, but no. For like a flattering beauty portrait, the 85 is perfect. Right. But if, for example, with a lot of my travel work, gritty I want to give it shots. like a real yeah. gritty, and I want to show the environment, yeah. and I want to kind of feel up and close and yep. intimate. Yep. And um, because there isn't much compression with that type of lens, the 24 to 70, then it really lends to feeling this, a sort of immediacy with your subjects. Well, we are not getting Vincent back. I don't know what happened. I think he lost his uh, internet connection because he's not responding. But I'll tell you what, I encourage people. It's fine because we were pretty much done anyway. We'll get him back for the, for the final tip. It just gives us an excuse to book him again. Yeah, we'll just bring him back. VincentLaforet.com is the website. Please go there and learn more. Don't forget his... Uh, visuals app which is available on the app store for iphone and ipad yeah and check out the new twit site and we have a new site i know it's TV. insane it's, it's well so awesome. it, we got work to do on it but oh. uh, but uh thank there's you there's always work to do it, it's a much better reflection of what we were trying to accomplish and if you are a fan of photography you've got to be a fan of katherine hall katherinehall.net is your great site you can learn more about her She's got more and more educational stuff, an image oh, wait, of the if week. You go to, if you click let's up the to, home. Let's I'll go to the image of the week. We'll just go to home, yeah. And then actually this is a good example of compression. This is called, oh, look at that. This is beautiful. This is called Glimpses of Hell and Torture. So this is an interesting photograph because so many people think they see it and they go, oh, this is such a, a pleasant, peaceful image. But what's on the wall is very different this than that perception. This is from Angkor Wat. Yeah. So I would recommend going to my Google Plus 
and reading the blog about it. And this more. is, you shot this with a longer lens? This is actually, this is a wider lens. Wider lens. Yeah, because I wanted to give it that um, initial outside wide perspective kind of convergence. So, you know, if, if I had shot with a longer lens, then I would have lost the depth of the, wi right. the wall on the side, right. which would have been effective. I mean, it just would have had a different feel. And I wanted to really exaggerate the side so walls. So you, when you pulled out your camera, you thought about this composition. You thought about what you wanted to do with it. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing that long lenses do, too, that I love, is anytime you're shooting in a... Say you're in an environment with a person, and um, you want to shoot a nice me. portrait, but the background's not 100%. If there's pillars... You can use that <laughs> long lens to compress the, right. the pillars to be a background. So right. if it's instead of separate as they are here. Yeah. yeah. So for example, like say the subject, there may not be, there may be people around, or there may be signs or something like that. You can isolate them by using right. that compression, which will give you a cleaner image. CatherineHall.net for more great images from the great Catherine Hall. Catherine, it's so much fun doing this show. Oops. Thank you for the. Thank you for bringing in such great guests. Vincent LaFerre is a hero of mine. He's taught us so much about I know. And his getting photography, emotion pictures. That's next time we'll bring him back for his photography. We will. Yeah. We will. We do this show every Wednesday around, uh, I'm sorry, Tuesday, Tuesday. around 1.30 p.m. Pacific, 4.30 Eastern. If you'd like to join us live, we'd love to have you watch live. We watch the chat room and we ask questions uh, the chat room asks of our great photographers. Who's next week? Next week we have, I'm like, who, what week is it? I have it on we, here. Are you excited? It's the uh, one I was most excited I have for. it on here. For is this you, the Playboy photographer? For all you out there. Oh. I decided I, I, I Arnie in some Freytag goods. Yeah, he's like is a legend. A legend. He's taken picture, more pictures of breasts than any human alive. <laughs> No, he is a playboy, one of the most, one of the foremost playboy photographers. Yeah, he's, he's done more centerfolds than anybody. Than anyone. And uh, we'll talk about not what you think we'll talk about. <laughs> no, he's the like if if you if within the Hollywood industry if you say who's the playboy photographer, it's Arnie Freytag. He's just amazing. We'll find out. He's been doing it forever. How so. he does it, and that'll be a lot of so fun. So we'll look at sexy ladies next week. Tell, tell your friends. Uh, <laughs> live. Actually, I don't have to say live at twit.tv anymore because it's right on the front page at twit.tv. Thank you, Catherine Hall. Thank you for being here. And we hope you'll come back and watch another episode with us of Twit Photo. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Great. He's great. I don't know. I wish I knew what happened to his... He lost his internet, yeah, or we would have been able to reach him. I'm sorry about that. No, no. no. We're going to bring you back. Landlord forgot to pay the electrical bill, so the guy shut down the no. entire electricity. What? In the middle of the interview. Yeah, he paid it last week. Guess they didn't receive the check yet. How'd you get it back on? Oh, it's not back on. I'm in the neighbor's place. Oh, and, no. And uh, servers are down. We can't work. And you know it's going to take him a few days to turn it back on. Oh, oh no. my God, that's horrible. Yeah. Well, at least it's not me not paying the bill. So I, it's it's still. Yeah, I've, I've actually had that happen to me because I'm just so forgetful. So busy. Yeah. So. Well, well you're good awesome. Guess. People Start loved you. Thank you. So, yeah. I'm sorry. Kind of fell off the face of the earth we'll, like that. We'll come. We'll bring you back. It's fine. It was. We were really almost done. We just had one more tip and we were done. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Vincent. You're welcome. Thanks, See guys. See you. We'll have you Cheers. back soon.